working full time and all of this stuff. So and try not to suck everyone everyone. coming in. Good morning and good afternoon. Welcome to day five of the Scores Soccer Summit. My name is Angela Bailey coming to you from America Scores Bay Area where we serve over 2000 students and work with over 80 different school sites in order to provide free soccer, poetry and service learning programming. Across the country, America Scores is in 12 different cities working with 306 school sites training and working with over a thousand coaches in order to provide service for 12,000 plus poet athletes, as we call them, poet athletes, because they are learning life lessons and expressing themselves on and off the field. We are so honored to bring the SCORE Soccer Summit to the community today. Special shout out to Alicia Yano for bringing these incredible speakers together who are incredibly inspiring. That is the goal of the SCORE Soccer Summit, to bring the community together, to sh share knowledge, to be inspired, and then to amplify our voice and take action. And there's no better way to take action than by joining the womeninsoccer.org network. Go to their website, sign up, membership is free, grow your soccer network and help amplify the community's voice. Second shout out to goal five, Definitely go check out Goal 5's website. It is soccer and sport apparel for her. It is beautiful, innovative, and it's about time. Okay. Thank you so much to Goal 5, to women in soccer, and to the whole community for being here today. Before I leave, I got to kick it off in true scores fashion. Every session, we bring in a poem, one of our young poet athletes voices. Today I'm going to read Isabel's poem. She's in the fourth grade at Moscone Elementary in San Francisco. Her poem is titled Athlete's Paradise. Soft grass and a single ball sway in the wind while parents shout and cheer to their daughters and sons. Itchy shin guards and long socks move as if cheering me on. As the cool water responds to my body, the sweat drop kisses my temples and whispers a sweet champion song to my ears pen and markers dance with the paper to appreciate our fellow players. Friday's hot sun brings blue skies and loud laughter. Rainbow shirts and alligator shoes fill the fields. Friday soccer is where you'll find an athlete's paradise. Thank you, Isabel, fourth grade. I'm gonna kick it over to Danielle Slayton, former US national player and now commentator for the San Jose Earthquakes. Thank you, Danielle, for being here. So excited to hear what you guys have to say. Thanks, Angela, um, and welcome, everybody. Uh, I am very, very excited to be joined by Heather O'Reilly today. Um, let me give you a little bit of background about Heather. If you don't know, uh, her accolades are quite extensive. I had to condense them down a little bit. Um, but Heather O'Reilly is one of the all-time greats in US women's soccer national team history. She was the top ranked recruit in high school, class of 2003, just a couple of years ago, <laughs> and already playing with the US national team as a high school senior. She joined University of North Carolina Tar Heels and would go on to lead them to two NCAA championships in 2003 and 2006 and three ACC championships. While in the midst of her time at Carolina, she represented the US women's national team as well. She is a three time Olympic gold medalist and played in three World Cups as well, capping things off with a championship in 2015 before retiring in 2016 from the women's national team. She ranks eighth in US women's national team history in caps, 11th in goals and sixth in assists. Um, her stats at UNC are equally impressive. She finished her college career tied for 10th in goals, 11th in points, 12th in assists, and her career was capped in 2006, where she led the Tar Heels to 27 straight wins, a national championship, and pretty much every award you could possibly win that year at the college level. Uh, professionally, she played for a long time, both here in the United States and overseas in England. She played for the Sky Blue of WPS. Um, she joined the Boston Breakers in 2013. She also played for Kansas City. She won titles at both Sky Blue and in Kansas City. She also then went over to play at Arsenal and the FAWSL in England before returning to play for the North Carolina Courage of the NWSL, winning the league crown in 2018. Currently, she um, 
works as an assistant coach for UNC. She's a new mom. She was a studio analyst for Fox Sports at the 2019 Women's World Cup where we got to work together. And she is an all around cool chick. And I am so happy that I get to know her. Welcome, 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 Heather. How you doing? Oh, Slay, and that was the best. Thank you for that wonderful introduction. Well, um, and you're, you're quite good at that. Um, not as not as good as you were on the field. I think sometimes we uh, we forget to mention how incredible you were as a defender. Danielle Slayton broke the Tar Heels hearts when she was a player at Santa Clara and won the national championship yourself one year, right? So um, yeah, I'm so happy to be here with you and talk a little bit about soccer and our love of America's Forest. Yes. Yeah, so um, let's just start. Let's go all the way back to the beginning. Okay, Heather, when and like, why did you start playing? How did you get into soccer when you were a kid? So uh, I consider myself very lucky because we had a lot of opportunities to play soccer in my town. I think um, I grew up in central New Jersey and sort of in the tri-state area, like New York, New Jersey, had a lot of immigrants. Um, and, and, and with that came a lot of uh, people from Europe that brought their soccer knowledge. So I always had wonderful coaches to play under. And um, quite frankly, even girls soccer was like strong in my community. Um, so I feel like I was fortunate to have those sort of opportunities, which I know that not everybody gets to have. And I also have three older brothers and I was the only girl in my family. So clearly I was always trying to keep up with the boys. And that was like a really big um, motivation for me and inspiration for me to sort of try to hang with the guys and impress them and feel like loved and accepted because of my athletic um, feats, I guess you can say. So I think that those two things are, are why I got into soccer. But I mean, I started playing just like anybody, like, you know, I, probably four years old uh, at the, in my town. It's probably a very bumpy field. But the thing is, is I remember my first soccer practice. Mm -hmm. I can like, I remember where I was. I remember who I was there with. And um, I just remembered loving it from, from the first day. Like I remember being with my team and loving being with the girls because I was a little bit shy back then. I know it's hard to believe now, but I was a little bit shy and I just felt like it was a nice way for me to feel like I was making friends and that I belonged. And for some reason, I guess it was from kicking it around with my brothers in the backyard, I like had a knack for it. I was quite good at it, even when I was, you know, just a little girl. And that gave me so much confidence and self-esteem. Um, and, you know, the rest is history. But that's why I was, that's why I was brought into uh, this game. And I'm so happy that it's been so weaved in my life for all these years. So you're a little bit younger than me. And when I first started playing, they didn't have all girls teams, right? So I started at four or five years old playing with boys. Did you always play with girls like that first practice was all you were always on a girls team or did you aside from your brothers did you play with boys at all I never played with boys I think um thanks to you know you and generations even before you for sort of paving the way for even my generation to have you know quality girls soccer um so I played sometimes with boys just to like get a challenge but um I never played on a boys team um so I feel, I feel like we've made some strides for, for you know, providing great opportunities for young females. But, um, you know, it, it's not, the, our work is not done yet, put it that way. That's true. Um, this is like, when I think about New Jersey, I mean, I, I put the whole state together, right? So I don't know the, the geography well enough to know like North or Central or South or whatever, but like, there are a lot of soccer players that come out of New Jersey. I mean, I think of, like Tobin Heath, right? I mean, she's from New Jersey. You're from New Jersey. Um, Carly Lloyd's from New Jersey. Like there's some serious women soccer players that have come out of New Jersey. Why do you think that is? <laughs> yeah, I think it goes back to, you know, what I was saying earlier about like it, that area just kind of draws people from all over the world, um, you know, particularly to like the New York City area. And so I think that it just uh, maybe had some good coaches from er early on um, from their experience in Europe. 
And also like anybody that's driven around New Jersey or New York City area, you know, you realize that you have to be like tough in that, you know, there's a lot of people in a very condensed area of the country. And because of that, you gotta like, you gotta like throw some bows a little bit. You gotta like be gritty, um, scrappy. You know, I grew up in very much like, well, say middle Heather you know, cutting just a worked little very hard was able to uh oh say that yeah, again that. the last thing okay. I was your hopefully scrappy. I'm back it was a scrappy um yeah I'm scrappy I'm gritty I think a lot of people from New Jersey take that approach to life I know that Carly Lloyd has always said that like she has a blue collar attitude and it's from her days, you know, in New Jersey. I, I don't know. I, like I said, a lot of people, tight area, everybody that is very ambitious and, and driven. So uh, maybe that's why yeah. uh, there's so many good players from New Jersey. But uh, yeah, it's, we do have our own little pack. Like even Christy Rampone, who played, uh, was the captain of the U.S. team for a long time. And, and, and a lot of other players also came from New Jersey. Uh, so we're, we'll always feel connected in that way. Yeah. Um, you talked a little bit about gaining confidence from playing soccer. You talked about your scrappiness, and, you know, and that kind of competitiveness. What are some of the skills that you feel like you learned at a young age or even as you got older through the game of soccer that have proved really useful to you um, throughout your life? Mm, wonderful question, because I think that there are so many that because soccer was so part of my life, it's, it's like hard to differentiate you know, all the things I learned from soccer, but I think certainly the, um, yeah, the f competitiveness and that's um, not only competitive with people that you're playing against, but competitive against yourself. And what I mean about that is um, this like, this fire, this churning to get better, to be better than you were yesterday. And and that doesn't mean just as a soccer player, it, it means like continuing to add layers to yourself as a human being. And I think that I learned that through soccer. I think I certainly learned how to work together uh, and be a good teammate. Um, if there's one thing that I'm super proud of for my entire career, um, it's, it's if somebody says that I was a good teammate because um, you know, we could be playing an individual sport. We could be, we could play golf or track and field or tennis or something like that. But the reason why we all love soccer is because of the team aspect and that we all bring something different to the table. And that's beautiful. Diversity is beautiful. It's sort of like a symbol of like outside society. It's like, I could never do what you did Slayton, like your tackling, your heading ability, uh, the way that you played defender, like before it was like um, the, the new age way to play. You were very like groundbreaking, like with the way that you attacked and things like that. Like I couldn't do what you did. And I think that there's probably some qualities that I had that you couldn't have done. And I think that like, <laughs> I think that that is amazing and beautiful. And so if I, uh, I think that I was a a good teammate and um, that I helped bring the best out of other people. And um, I've always heard this saying that like, you can show power by two ways, by pulling up or by pushing down. And I think that I've, you know, for the most part, I'm not perfect, but I've chose to pull up and I've chose to bring others with me. Um, and yeah, and I think that I've learned that through the game. I think that I've learned um, to set goals. Like you can't just say, oh, I want to make a World Cup team and I want to be a World Cup winner and like have these big dreams, but then, but then what? Like, I think that you have to say that, then you have to say, okay, well, what's my path? And am I going to put the effort in? Am I going to have the focus to like get to that big goal? So I certainly think that goal setting was um, something that I learned from soccer. And I think that that served me in my school life and other things that I've done outside um, soccer and school. It's just like having a goal and then mapping a path of how to get there and getting there step by step. Um, I know that um, Danielle, you probably remember Dr. Colleen Hacker. And I always remember something that Dr. Hacker said, she was our sports psychologist. 
She said, the elevator to the top is broken. Unfortunately, you have to take the stairs. And I always remember that, um, that you got to take the stairs. So that, that's something else that I learned uh, through soccer. But yeah, countless um, things. Like I said, it's almost hard to, to think about sometimes because it has been such a huge part of my life and a huge part of how I do, do a lot of things in my life. Yeah, and so many skills that are transferable, right? I mean, it's, I think about that all the time. It's like, who cares if I can kick a soccer ball 40 yards now, right? I, that's not a, an important aspect of my day-to-day -day life anymore. Um, but there are just so many skills, as you've referenced, um, that I have proven useful to me on a daily, sometimes hourly basis that I learned in the game. So um, really grateful for that. Um, talk a little bit about how you decided um, to, to go to UNC and ultimately like your transition from, you know, playing as a youth player in New Jersey and then transitioning to UNC all the time, all the while, like really making your first steps on the women's national team uh, stage at that point too, because it all kind of coincided within a, within a few years. Yeah, um, I think, well, especially back then, North Carolina was you know, quite the dynasty, I think, between Santa Clara and UNC, that you were, you know, dominant programs at the time. And um, I just was one of those little girls that I, I like loved the women's national team. And I loved University of North Carolina, just because it was, you know, it was really kind of the only thing that I knew in terms of like, where the really top, top players were going. So when I sort of was making, um, making ground sort of like starting to separate myself from my peers and my age group. And I was sort of starting to advance and make all these top select teams, we'll say, um, playing at University of North Carolina was, uh, was going to be an option for me. And I remember calling the head coach who was trying to get me to go to the, to the school. And it was back in the day when you would have, you know, the phone like this. And I remember I hit every other number except the last number to call him. And I like, my heart was pounding. I was so nervous and I couldn't do it. And I hung up and I just like sat there for a while. I was just so shy and so nervous. And then I tried it again and I hit the last number and Anson Doran's picked up and the rest was history. He said, you know, I want you to come to University of North Carolina. Um, we've had a lot of great players here before, but we think that you are special and you are different. And, and here's why. And I think that that was really important for me to hear because I think a lot of times you think that you'll just be like one of the pack and one of the mix, but really it goes back to what we were talking about with, with being a team. I think that you always have to remember what you're great at and what you're different in um, and what makes you unique. Um, and that's um, something that I still need to do now. Um, you know, even like being a mom, there's like, there's, there's been millions of moms out there, but it's like, well, how am I different? How am I unique? And what, how am I going to bring this different um, style to, to being a mom? And that's exactly what I did as a soccer player. So I think that the, you can never forget what makes you different. And a lot of times we try to focus on what we need to improve on, but I always tell people never forget what you're already very, very good at and take a lot of pride in that. Um, and so, yeah, I, I went to University of North Carolina and it was one of those things like when you, uh, I stepped onto the campus and I just felt like it was right. Like it was something that I wanted to be part of. And I still feel that way now. I actually live in my university town now in Chapel Hill, North Carolina, because it's just a community that I love. I just feel like I just click with the place and, um, yeah, I've never, never looked back. Um, as you mentioned, you, you live in Chapel Hill right now. You're an assistant coach. You work with the team um, currently. Can you talk just a little bit about the culture of UNC? Um, because as you mentioned, right, such a, a dynasty in so many regards. I mean, maybe arguably the most winning program in all sports, like male or female over time. I mean, just such a, such a huge amount of success that the UNC women's soccer team has had. What is it about the culture, about the leadership um, that makes that, that program, this team so successful and why is that important? Well, uh, the head coach of Carolina is a guy named Anson Dorans, who some people might be familiar with, some people might not be, but he's been there from the very beginning. So there's been a, when we talk about culture, 
you know, he's been like the mainstay. He's been the one that, you know, the, the program has revolved around and players come and go, you know, Mia Hamm played here, Christine Lilly, and then current players, you know, uh, national team players is Tobin Heath and Crystal Dunn. Um, so, uh, you know, different generations of players, but Anson really is, was the, you know, the, the, the center of it all. And so I think that when we talk about UNC, it's hard to separate uh, that culture from, from him. But I think that um, what, the, what the program revolves on is um, a training competitiveness. And um, Anson believes in something called the competitive cauldron, which is basically uh, keeping track of drills, keeping track of scores of games, like through your entire season and wins, losses, shooting competitions, all this stuff. And um, his philosophy is just like, if you know somebody's watching every detail, like you will form these habits over time. And um, if you know that a game is being tracked and your score is being counted, there's times in the game where you will compete at a higher level than if you weren't. And, and then those habits become ingrained. So when you make it to a World Cup final, you're not as nervous anymore because you've done these things on a daily basis uh, to make you the player that you are. And so I would say that the, the training competitiveness is, is sort of what kind of differentiates the program. And to be honest, it's one of those things like we don't talk about winning. We don't talk about winning a national championship. We don't talk about winning a conference title. It, the results and the winning comes as a byproduct of what you do every single day. So it's just, you know, I, and I think that's like a good way to live. It's like, we can, yeah, sure. You can have these dreams. Like I said, you can have these dreams, but really it's about what you do every single day. And that, that um, compiling, I think of habits and uh, hard work and focus, all that will add up. And then you all of a sudden will find yourself having success instead of always like reaching for it and, and just dreaming about it. You'll actually get there um, based on, on how you sort of act every single day. So I think that that's a little piece of what the UNC program is all about. And, and also, yeah, it's about pride and, and community. I think we've been uh, right now, I'm actually in charge of leadership um, alumni engagement. And it's just so phenomenal to sort of look back on these decades of players that have come through here and, and it makes you a family. And I think that in this wacky year that we have, that we've seen, you know, everybody has faced it in, in different ways. But I think that, you know, there is some silver lining that comes through something as challenging as this. And, and I think one of the things for me is that to just like reflect on what communities are very important to me and make sure that I sort of take care of them. Um, and I know that the America Scores community is so um, special to a lot of people. The Bay Area community is so special to a lot of people on this call. And for me, uh, you know, over here, the, the UNC community is, is, is very special to me and the soccer community. I know that you feel the same way about the soccer community, Danielle. Um, and you feel as if you're a steward of that community and you wanna leave it into a good place. So, um, yeah, I, I hope that that answered the question, but that's a little bit of what Carolina is all about, competitiveness and family, uh, and therefore winning some trophies. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I think you, um, you hit the nail on the head and it's that if you focus on the process, you know, more than the results, the results, hopefully, if, you know, if, if your process is good and you, you bring that effort and that dedication to the process, then the results will will follow and you know UNC certainly is a, an example of that. Um, you talked about America Scores and I know you've been involved with America Scores for a while now in a bunch of different cities. Can you talk about your, um, your experience and how you got involved with America Scores initially and what that's been like? Yep, so I learned about Scores a, a long time ago. It was actually when uh, the US team was out in Los Angeles where we would have training camps a lot and uh, Carson, California, and the LA Scores group actually came and we put on a clinic for LA Scores um, after one of our training sessions with the national team. It was the first time that I learned about the Scores program and, and what it was all about. And I actually have a 
a education degree from the University of North Carolina. So um, if I wasn't playing soccer, I would probably be a teacher. And my mom was a teacher, um, you know, in her younger days. And so that's always kind of been in my family. And even when I was a little girl, like I would pretend to be a teacher to my like little stuffed animals and stuff. It's always just been sort of in my DNA, I suppose. And so when I heard about this program that I was like, oh my gosh, this is blending, um, you know, these two things that I absolutely adore. And I like working with young people and I understand the power of soccer. It's been so huge for my life and I see it you know, there's not many things in the world that can bring people together like soccer. I mean, it is the world's game um, and it does kind of bind us together. Um, so I just found the program to be really special and I saw it, uh, you know, through stories of some of the students that had come through, like changing people's lives. And I just knew that I wanted to be part of it. And I feel an immense responsibility to sort of um, to give back and to give others the opportunity to play this amazing game um, that I did. And so, um, you know, whenever I'm, I've been able to travel and soccer has kind of taken me all over the country, um, I try to, you know, stop in to as many sites as possible and just play with the kids. And, uh, you know, if I can say even one thing that makes somebody you know, change the way that they look about the game or their life. Um, I feel like that's such a huge success and such a huge honor that I get to do. So um, yeah, that's, that's why I adore scores and I'm so happy to be here talking about it. Yeah, well, kudos to you and kudos to all the coaches who are working with, um, with young people in the America Scores program. Um, on that note, feel free, everybody who is on the call right now, please type in any questions you have for Heather in the chat and we'll try to get to those as best we can. Um, Heather, along those lines, um, obviously I, I, I referenced this earlier, but you, know, you are a coach at UNC, an assistant coach. Um, was that just a natural progression for you after playing? I mean, you have this education background, which is, you know, kind of coaching, teaching, it's related. Um, did, did that just make sense for you after you were done playing to, to get into coaching? Yeah, uh, it did make sense. I think that, like I said, um, I love the game. So I certainly wanted to stay in soccer in some capacity after my playing career was over. Um, and yeah, for me, like, being with young people, passing on what I've learned, um, it, it does make sense and it, it does feel good and, and it does fit. I think for me, I loved playing, like so nothing really is as fun as playing. Playing soccer is so much fun, but seeing other people do well um, and impacting people is something that's pretty cool. A close second, I would say. So uh, yes, I think that it was sort of a natural fit. And like you said, there's being a coach is sort of being a teacher. You know, you're teaching not only soccer skills, but life skills. And um, let's be real, it's way more fun to be out on the soccer field than in the classroom. So if I'm gonna be a teacher, it made sense for me to be a teacher uh, on the field. Yeah. Um, you, you talked about, you know, like soccer being awesome, right? You love the game. But eventually, you know, almost everybody has to stop, whether it's, you know, at a high school age or a college age or professional age. Yeah, we could still, you know, kick the ball around and go play pickup, but maybe competitive soccer, um, you know, stops for, for most people at some point in our lives. Um, was it hard for you to transition out of the game? Was that a loss? Was it just the natural progression? Like, I don't feel like we talk about kind of that I don't know, sad or ugly or yeah. side of the end of the game um, for people. I know it was hard for me. Was it hard for you? Oh, I mean, it's still so hard. Um, and I agree. I don't think that, I think that if you end in high school, in college, professionally, um, no matter how old you are, sometimes it is sad to close chapters of your life, right? And well, one, I guess I want to say that like, I know that you said we could, you could still play pickup, but um, soccer doesn't need to end for anybody. Clearly your top professional career needs to end. Um, but I, I tell people, you know, you could be playing for a long time. You can be involved in the game in different ways. So I, I hope that everybody like knows that and feels that and, and doesn't give up 
um, completely. If it stays, you know, whether they're a coach or helping out with a program like America Scores, there's different ways to like to continue on with the game. But yes, yeah, certainly, I, I think, um, yeah, stepping away from the game was excruciatingly difficult for me uh, because I do love it so much. And I think that, um, you know, even though I have other things going on in my life, like I have a baby, I have a husband, I have a house, dog, all that stuff. It's like soccer was such a huge part of the way that I saw myself. I saw myself as a soccer player and, um, you know, that's how I made my friends. Like since I was a little girl, that's how I felt like a uh, part of things. So uh, I had a huge fear, I think, when I was coming to the end of my soccer career that it would, um, it would be a loss. It was almost like a grieving process. I'm like, this, this part of me is dying kind of thing uh, when it was coming to an end. Um, but, you know, I got through it with, with some wonderful, like, support from, from coaches and friends and family, you know, that, that you know, it, it was just a, opening a, a, a door. And sometimes it's, it's tough to, to make that transition. But, um, yeah, I want everybody to know that whether you're, you're stopping at age, you know, 17 or age 35, like, it is, uh, it is difficult sometimes. But, um, you know, the, the good thing is when you – are so passionate about something that that's beautiful. Uh, it might make, you know, the end harder. Um, but I think that that's the way to live, right? Like to just really go for things and to live with a big heart and an open heart. And uh, you might leave yourself exposed for heartbreak that way. But I think that it's uh, a lot better than, than not, uh, not loving something at all. Um, to its maximum, if that makes sense. Yeah. No, that's totally, I mean, that, and that, from what I know of you, that embodies you, right? Like as a player, as a friend, as a teammate, like you just put it all out there, which is why we love you so much. Um, so I want to leverage your expertise now as, as a coach, you've shifted into that, um, that role. And so we've got a, a, one question here from the audience. What advice would you give to a female coaches interested in getting, who are interested in getting into coaching college soccer? Um, well, first of all, I would say that there has, there's not too many women that are coaching boys, college soccer, men's world, uh, men's soccer. So if you want to be truly groundbreaking, I would say to, you know, explore that and, and see if that's something that interests you or see, you know, I think all automatically as a female, we are kind of, um, expected to only coach females, but clearly that doesn't have to be. Um, a lot of men's coaches coach on the women's side. So why not the other way around? Um, so that would be my first thing that I would say. And um, yeah, I, I guess um, just go for it, follow your heart and um, put yourself out there. There might, you know, there's still a serious lack of female coaches. So don't be deterred by not seeing uh, this as a possibility or an opportunity. I'd say like, pave your own path um and uh if it's something that you you want to do um just go for it it, it is um a, a job that comes with a lot of responsibility because i think the beautiful thing about the college age group is these these young people are like ages 18 to 22 and this is why i actually love working with college age student athletes because they are really kind of starting to get it. They're starting to get like who they are and living on their own and figuring out who they want to be and who they want to spend time with. Um, but they're also really able to be shaped still and influenced in a positive way and set on a really good path in life. Um, so I take that responsibility very seriously and, um, and yeah, and I would say go for it. I think it's a wonderful, uh, job and uh, uh, something that's been very fulfilling to me. Yeah. Um, another question from, from Colin is, what are the top two or three things that you would say to coaches, either men or women coaches, um, who are working with young girls and maybe they're college young girls or maybe even younger than that, but what's important for, um, for coaches to be aware of when coaching girls? And is there a is there even a difference, right, in your mind of coaching girls or boys or men or women? 
Yeah, I, I think that it's like a debate that's been had for, for so long, right? I think, um, I don't know, I, I think that it is fair and perfectly okay to say that there is differences. Um, there's a lot of things that are the same as well. Um, so I don't think it's like a completely different um, sport. I think uh, so much of the, the fundamentals of the game are the same. Um, I think women are, you know, girls are as competitive as boys in a lot of ways, um, you know, tech, technical, tactical, like there's so many similarities there. But I would say that from a uh, psychological standpoint, there's differences and, and that's okay. I think from, from the way that I see it, um, girls are stereotypically more concerned about the team dynamics, about being, um, being liked, being accepted. Um, whereas boys just, you know, they're sort of, uh, okay being called selfish or like say a goal scorer, uh, doesn't pass the ball and then somebody yells at him, he'll like brush it off. Like it's no big deal. Whereas like something like that could sit with a girl for like a long time because there's, uh, you know, some sensitivities there, but those sensitivities also make some females just like so, um, such wonderful teammates and care about the people around them. And that has so many advantages as well. So I think it's a long winded way to say like, yes, there are differences, like be very alert um, to the social and psychological, um, areas of each player. And it, it might take a little bit more effort for a coach to sort of know like, okay, why does this girl play? What is her family environment? Like, what does the game mean to her? Uh, what else is she interested in? And, and, and might, um, those things that sort of, um, you know, make her love the game, I think like get to know those things because you'll get the best out of her as a player. And, um, and yeah, I think that you'll, you'll learn a lot about her and, and, and the way that, you know, she's motivated. I think it's really, that's a big part of being a coach, right? It's defining what makes you tick and that takes effort and intentionality in, um, when you watch people, when you watch your players and the questions that you ask them and, um, and the situations that you put them in. Um, so yeah, it might take a little bit more intentionality, but I wouldn't say that that's something to shy away from. I would say that that's, uh, that's an amazing thing that you have an opportunity to do as a coach. Yeah. And I would, I would make that argument like as a leader, right? Understanding why somebody ticks and understanding what their motivation is, I think is going to help us regardless of the industry or the field that we're in and getting the most out of those that we work with for sure. Um, speaking with like, speaking about like player and coach dynamics, um, have you, we have a question um, from Rambo. Uh, have you ever had disagreements with a coach? Maybe like you didn't agree with the style of play or the formation. Um, and how did you navigate that? Or maybe as a coach, like you've had a player at UNC who didn't agree with something and how do, you, how do you manage that when you don't agree with a player or you don't agree with a coach? What do you do? Yeah, uh, it, it is tough because, you know, you know, just think of a starting lineup. There's 11 different minds on the field and 11 different personalities. Then you have the rest of the team. Then you have the coaching. Side. So you're talking about like a team is, let's say 20, 20 people who all have different ideas, uh, good ideas, but you, you need somebody to channel those ideas to work together. So that's what a coach should be doing. Um, it's not diminishing anybody or stifling anybody, but you do have to work together um, to play a certain way or sometimes decisions need to be made about who plays, who doesn't play, who's on a team. And we're all individuals. So, you know, even people, even your bestest friend you still think about some things differently than them. Even my husband, like clearly we think about some things very differently. Like you're never, you're the most unique person um, with your own thoughts. So you'll never completely agree with everybody else. So I think that it just comes down to, for me, it comes down to respect. It's respect, like 
just because you have an opinion and you are so sure that you are right and this is the truth, you have to pull yourself away from that and say like, this is your truth and they have their truth. And it, then it comes down to respect and seeing each other uh, through those differences. And um, I think that open communication is huge with somebody that you disagree with, even with a coach. Um, you know, instead of letting things just like brew and boil for a long, long time um, to just open communication and talk things through, um, I think that it is always really helpful and kind of gets to the bottom of things um, maybe quicker than it, it would have if you just kind of sat with it and were angry about it for so long. And I think um, one thing that I've learned about being part of good teams is that like, you keep things in house in terms of like, you don't talk about problems outside the team or you don't talk to your other teammates about another one of your teammates or you don't talk to the coach about other teammates. You know, like those kinds of gossipy um, things, I don't think help great teams achieve what they want to achieve. So. Um, it's about being respectful of people's differences and it's about communication. And, um, I think with those things that you can at least, you know, come to a common ground of understanding. You're never, you, you might not get your way with your, with your disagreement. Um, but, you know, I think that you'll find respect and, and you'll move through some challenges. Um, you talked about, you know, having all of these dynamic personalities. And I think that was the case, you know, at least my experience with the national team, right? There's some pretty big, strong personalities. I'd imagine it was the same way for you in college. Um, and all of these, you know, these badass women coming together, um, but who want to compete, who've created this super competitive environment. Um, and there's a lot of great that, that comes from that, right? Like the women's national team and the success you've had and the success our country has had on the women's side um, is, is huge, right? Like we've had an example of that. But are there any negative consequences to like having that uber competitive environment um, that maybe coaches should be aware of and trying to mitigate? Like, is there a stress involved with that? Like what's, what's the right balance there? Yeah, I definitely think that like, um... Yeah, big personalities and, and different personalities um, are hard to mesh. And that's, that's like a, a difficult job for a coach. And at the women's national team level, I think that was maybe the toughest job for the coach. I mean, there's a reason why in Europe, especially they, they use the term manager instead of coach, because you are managing players, you're managing personalities, you're managing egos. Um, and so, and another thing that you have to realize at the professional ranks, like these are people's jobs. These are people's livelihoods. This is how they're feeding their families. Like this isn't just like, oh, I want to be a starter or I'm not a starter. This is like, I want to collect a paycheck. Um, so there are some intense dynamics. And, and then of course, you know, with fame comes sponsorships and endorsements and all these things. And um, you know, with that kind of comes jealousies, et cetera. So there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot that needs to be managed. Um, yeah. And I think that it is a challenge, but it, again, it comes down to respect. And I think that the cool thing about team sports is that the better the team does, the better each individual looks, you know? And so, um, if you sort of put your focus into the team and bringing the best out of the team, you in turn as an individual will, will achieve the things that you want to achieve. So it's pretty rare that like any individual, even somebody like Messi, for instance, like one of the best players in the world ever. Um, but if given the choice of, okay, Messi, you could win FIFA player of the year award or you could win a World Cup with Argentina. He will choose win the World Cup with Argentina 10 times out of 10 um, because this is a team game. And, um, and it, that's, it, that's what this is all about. So 
uh, again, I think it's, it's a challenge sometimes, but again, it, it's remembering respect. It's remembering that everybody's different and let's pull each other up instead of push each other down. And with pulling each other up, we all raise up. Yeah. Uh, and I think that's been a really cool thing of the women's national team through the years. And certainly there's been tough times and challenges. It hasn't always been like super smooth, but I think, you know, part of wearing that crest is, is pulling each other up. And knowing that, like, we can't do this by ourselves. No individual is good enough um, to do it by themselves. And, um, and, and for the most part, we have uh, raised each other up and made each other better. And, and that's really been so helpful. Yeah. Um, so I unfortunately have to run, but we're not done. So nobody log off yet because I'm going to kick it over to Alicia um, to maybe talk um, with Heather, a little bit about some of those fun soccer memories, maybe a little bit about, um, you know, pay equity and why that fight continues to be so important in the future of, of women's soccer. Um, so Heather, thank you, thank you, thank you for the time. I'm so sad that I have to leave, but I have another day job that pays me and that I have to run off for a meeting. <laughs> so Thanks, love- Layton. All right, girly. Thank All you right. so much. Thank you so Good much, job. Danielle. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Heather, thank you for continuing um, more questions. Not a problem. I'm going to get some questions from the audience here. Um, Norma wants to know, what is your favorite soccer memory? Ooh, I'm very lucky because I have so many. Um, One of my favorite memories was um, this one game in particular. It was the uh, quarterfinals of the London Olympic Games. And why that was, um, or sorry, semifinals of the Olympic Games. I don't know why I just said quarterfinals, semifinals. And why it was so special was I didn't start that game. So I was a little bit bummed, but uh, I knew that I had a good chance of being a substitute. So I really had to like kind of get my mind straight. And even though I was disappointed to not be starting, I needed to be ready. Um, it was also at, uh, in, in, at Manchester United Stadium at Old Trafford. And so that, you know, there was just this wonderful environment. It was so cool. I was a huge Manchester United fan. So that was really neat. And we were playing Canada and the game was crazy. And I'm on the bench watching this game and it's insane, like back and forth, back and forth. And the score was three to three and we were going into overtime and the coach put me in in overtime. And I remember I was like, not really touching the ball too much. The clock was like ticking down and it looked very likely that we were going into penalty kicks. And I'm already like, I'm on the field. I'm like, Oh my gosh, we're going into penalty kicks. Like, am I going to take a kick? Like these thoughts started to like sort of creep into my mind, but I kept focused and, um, Abby Wambach passed me a ball and I was able to make a really great cross, which was something that I worked on over and over and over. It really became kind of like my thing, my craft, my contribution to the team. And Alex Morgan headed it home and in the back of the net in the 123rd minute. Um, And we went on to win that game, of course. And then we went on to win the Olympic uh, gold. And I, I think that like, it's my favorite memory because I'm just so proud of myself and proud of the team, but also I mean, just really proud of myself that I stayed focused and I did my part. I did my part really well. And um, who knows if I didn't do my part really well, what would have happened? You know, maybe mm-hmm. we go into penalty kicks, maybe we don't win. Um, but uh, I'm really proud of that. I just remember like being with my family after the game and just, yeah, just smiling and just, feeling really proud that I was able to help the the team. And so that was maybe my favorite soccer moment. Well, that's a really nice one to replay in your head all the time. (laughs) I like that. Um, What player on the team right now do you see as a breakout star um, in for their playing career? Mm. Um, I look at somebody like Crystal Dawn and I think that she has, you know, she's, She's been around now for a while, so she's not necessarily uh, a breakout star, but I, I do know that like Crystal um, is really proud being 
African American girl, woman now um, on the national team having so much success because you know there hasn't been too many African American women on the team. Um, you know, of course, we we just saw da Danielle Slayton being the moderator, so that it you know she's not the first, but there hasn't been uh, a ton of women that Crystal thought looked like her. So I know that she's really excited to be able to be a role model for girls out there. Um, and, and from her soccer standpoint, she is a, a wonderfully exciting player. She can play so many dis, uh, different positions. She's uh, a very skilled athlete. She's very quick and explosive. Um, but I think more than anything, it's her um, decision-making ability and her ability to play so many different positions that I don't think that people give that enough credit. Usually you have uh, a very specific thing that you're great at, but Crystal's so great at so many different things. She can be considered the best, one of the best in the world as a defender and one of the best in the world as like uh, a second striker. And not many people can do that. So I think that she is a wonderf wonderful uh, ambassador for the sport. And uh, I can't wait to see what she does on the pitch and, and off it in years to come. Awesome. I agree with you. <laughs> um, this question is from Sarah. Um, after stopping competitive play, what activity or exercises have you found to be the closest that give you the feeling of what you got when you played soccer? And I'm oh, going to yeah. just, oh, I'm sorry. I'm going to go just a little bit farther and, and ask, do you scrimmage with um, the UNC team when you're coaching and do you ever go just play pickup? And Yeah, yeah. I do. I love playing still. I think that some professional players, when they like stop, it's very hard for them to continue to play for two reasons. One, maybe their body is maybe they've like had injuries or something like that where it just kind of hurts to play <laughs> or two. I know that it's, sometimes it's frustrating for players as they get older to not be able to do what they used to do. And some people that it's like so frustrating that it like turns them off from playing but I'm still of the mind frame that like, I still love playing. So of course I still sub myself into Carolina practice all the time. And um, even when I was pregnant with my son, I until about like six months pregnant, I would jump in and the girls are like, Oh my gosh, like what happens if we hit her? Like, but I was smart. I stayed out of it. But anyways, I played until pretty much six months pregnant. And I was like, okay, it's time for me to step away. My feet hurt and I should probably stop. But uh, I, I love the, the sport and I, I, I can see myself being one of those women that play until I'm like 75 years old. It'll, it'll be a little bit slower, um, but, but I'll be out there still. But I think from a physical side of things, um, it, it's, it's a good question because it's hard to find exercise that is as exciting and as fulfilling as being a professional player. Because when you think about it, if I'm going to practice every day as a professional player, so one, when you exercise, you give endorphins out. So basically um, happiness, you get a lot of joy from, from exercising. You're around people. So you get like the social component, you you get high fives. So you get all these pre pandemic, you get all these um, rewards, I would say. And so, yeah, it's kind of hard to find that when you stop playing. Um, so I've been sort of seeking like what my next physical challenge is. It's been a little bit wacky because it's this year, there's like so much that's like closed and stuff like that. But I can see myself wanting, I definitely want to run a marathon at some point and um, some smaller races and things like that. But I am a true competitor. So uh, a lot that I do will be like competitive. Um, and there's this gym called Orange Theory. I don't know if you guys have it out there. I yeah. love Orange Theory. I love the music. I love the energy. And to be honest, I love being told what to do. I have come to realize this about myself. I am very coachable. I've been <laughs> told what to do for a long time, like on the soccer pitch in terms of um, you give me a task and I will try to execute it. Um, and so... I think that uh, when I'm at Orange Theory and the coach is like yelling things out, I'm like, okay. And I feel like right at home, <laughs> like it's like back to my soccer playing days. Nice. Well, being coachable, um, there was a question and I can't remember what it was right now on who um, asked it in the audience, but 
uh, you are coachable and coach Anson is seems like he's a super mellow guy. Do you guys ever have disagreements? <laughs> um, as coaches? Yes. <laughs> well, um, I think that, you, you know, you can have, and I wouldn't say that we've had disagreements, but we definitely have different viewpoints sometimes. And, and, and that's fine. And I think it, it, he's also my boss. So <laughs> he gets the final word, you know? Um, but for the most part, we are cut from the same cloth, like in terms of our competitive nature and, uh, I don't know, there's just a lot of like similarities in, in our approach. So I think that we work well together, but I do think that, um, we can make each other think about things differently sometimes as well. Uh, do you have aspirations to be a head coach? Uh, yes, I think so. I think that. Um, I, I think I'm in a stage of my life right now where I'm like just trying a lot of different things and uh, allowing myself a little bit of time and space to, to do that because for so long I was like soccer player, soccer player, soccer player and right. even you know that it comes with uh, you know a lot of positives but the negatives of that sometimes are that you don't get a variety of experiences mm -hmm. um, especially job experiences so um, so we'll see. I like doing the TV stuff. I like coaching and, and to be honest, I have a five month old right now. So that's, uh, taking up a lot of my mental energy. Um, yeah. so yeah, we'll see. Uh, as, as, as somebody once said to me, life, life is short, but it is wide. You get to do <laughs> a lot of, a lot of things and have a lot of experiences and meet a lot of people. So, um, that's what I'm trying to do right now. Nice. I like that. That's a good attitude. Um, we have a couple more questions. Um, this is a little bit ser more serious. So um, the recent decision for the equal working conditions for the U.S. Women's National Team uh, finally has um, passed. Um, what is the importance of this decision, not just for soccer, but for women and girls in general? Oh, I think the, the, the women's national team ha, have been real leaders and, and pioneers in their quest for equal pay and equal working conditions. And I think um, it all kind of goes back to uh, the World Cup that happened in 2015 in Canada. And somebody approached us, uh, a lawyer actually approached us and was just like, what do you guys think that think of the fact that the the World Cup is on turf, artificial turf, and the men's World Cup has never been on turf, will ever probably be on turf. And some, some men's players like hate playing on turf and refuse to play on turf. Like, what do you guys think about that? And we're like, well, we hate it, of course. It's terrible, like that they would be different, but what can you do? It's like, this is what we're given. And he was just like, I think that you have a fight here. Like, you have a fight for equal conditions that aren't being served. And, and it just really kind of made us think that like, we were just kind of like taking what we could get instead of demanding a standard. And I think after that, that, that helped us all sort of think that we are leaders in this regard. And it is really important for us to um, continue to push for equality and where we feel like things are not fair to try to make them fair. And um, it, it is very complicated in some ways in, in the, the fight for, for equal pay from the standpoint of um, if FIFA is not acting as that and prize money is not acting like that, it is very difficult for US soccer to then give the same prize money to the men's and women's teams. Um, because, well, the women's team wins quite a bit and um, I think we would bankrupt them. I don't know. So, um, but I, I think that that's a, still a worthy cause to continue to raise and it, it causes conversation and it causes progress and it causes change. And I think that the, the uh, equal working conditions it will kind of is, is stemming from that as well. Like, okay, if the prize money is not the same from FIFA um, for winning the World Cup, that's disappointing and we're going to continue to work on that. While that is being done, um, here's how we can 
equal out everything that's under our control. And, um, and so, you know, things like fields and travel and things like that, that to some people might not seem like a huge deal. That's something like that we can control as an organization, they can control it. And um, let's take care of things that are in house and then, and then work on things that um, will hopefully improve in the future. Well, I think it's had a worldwide um, catalyst. I mean, Brazil, Brazil women's national team, I think as Norway and the Netherlands now yeah. are equal pace. So yeah. um, I, I think what our women's team is doing here is just magnificent and um, it's good for the world. Definitely. Um, this is our last question because um, I know you need to go, but the whole purpose of this summit is to bring women and girls together um, by listening to top leaders and the community sharing action items and you know what we can do to raise up soccer for women and girls. So as a leader in soccer, what are you hoping to achieve personally and what action items do you see and envision the community to do in the next five or 10 years? Hmm. Well, I, I think professionally for me, and I think I, I sort of touched on it is I, I don't want to, if, if it is coaching that I am pursuing, I don't want to automatically think that I only can work in women's football. Mm-hmm. I want to make sure that I, that I open that view and that I consider coaching boys, coaching men, and maybe I will coach girls and that's perfectly fine and um, a wonderful profession, but I want to make sure that I am like at least opening my eyes to what else might be out there because it could be my life passion to work with 18 year old boys and, and they could be um, so much better for it as well. And so I think for me professionally, I want to um, make sure that I am sort of seeing all possibilities and not pigeonholing myself into things that have been done before. That's sort of my goal. Um, so I guess how people can help me is if anybody has sort of worked with men and boys and just help me kind of navigate that, like what was helpful in your journey, what I should think about, who I should speak to, um, that, that could be helpful for me. And um, yeah, and another thing that I'm trying to do from a media standpoint is just continue to talk about the world game. Like for instance, I, um, I, I just did a, like a recap show on what's going on in European women's football because we talk about equal pay and, and all this stuff, but you know, we, we need to be, the visibility needs to be there. So you need games on television. You need sponsors to want to pay these athletes. You, uh, you know, in order for us to be on level ground, we as females and we as soccer players, well, we need to be pushing our own, our own stuff out there and be stewards for the game. And so um, I'm trying to do that as well. So yeah, if you're a fan of women's soccer, um, just demand more, demand more from sponsors, demand more from, from, from television um, decision makers on what should be on, uh, just demand more from clubs. Um, for instance, I know that um, Tottenham uh, women's team just recently was um, allowed, I guess, for lack of better words, to train at the men's facility. And mm. That should have been happening, in my opinion, for a long time. But, um, you know, now Alex Morgan is playing over at Tottenham. And now, uh, with a little bit more visibility to the women's side, now this change is happening. So um, I think that it's like kind of like be the change that you want to see, things that you wish for, um, put, put action behind it. And I think that we'll all be uh, raising, raising the game up. I um, totally agree with you. And Courtney um, made a really great um, suggestion in the chat box um, for some good role models for women who do coach men's teams. Um, Kim Wyant, she's at uh, NYU. 
And then of course, Carrie Taylor is former coach for the um, San Diego Loyals. So very cool. Yeah, definitely. Um, I want to thank you so much for joining us today um, and taking time and being such a great supporter of SCORES. Um, it's been so great to learn more about you and um, we definitely want you to come back. <laughs> we, we, we cannot get enough of you. Um, so um, thank you so much and good luck with all that you're doing. It sounds like you are like juggling, literally juggling. You've got your baby, your coaching, TV stuff. So um, I have no doubt that you're going to be successful in all the endeavors that you do. Thank you. Um, and I want to thank everyone out in the audience for um, attending and please come back. We have the Mindful Project as our next um, session. And then we have a session with Carrie Taylor actually about marketability with Maggie Nen, um, sports um, agent. And then lastly today, we're gonna to talk with Leslie Gallimore, uh, commissioner of the Girls Academy. Um, so thank you to our partners, Goal 5 and Women in Soccer. I hope everyone has a really great day. And once again, thank you so much, Heather. And um, stay safe, everybody. Thank you. Stay safe. Bye-bye.